I think what is probably the most misunderstood concept in all of science, and as we all know, is now turning into one of the most contentious concepts, maybe not in science, but in our popular culture, and that's the idea of evolution. Evolution. And whenever we hear this word, I mean, even if we don't hear it in the biolo biological context, we imagine that something is changing. It is evolving. And so when, we, when people use the word evolution in our everyday context, they think of this notion of change that, you know, this is going to test my drawing ability. But they, you know, you see a, uh, an ape, you know, bent over. We've all seen this picture at the natural museum and he's you know walking hunchback like that and his head's bent down and oh, I'm doing my best that's the ape maybe maybe he's also wearing a hat and then you know they show this picture where he slowly slowly becomes more and more upright and eventually you know he turns into some dude who's just walking on his way to work you know also just as happy and now he's walking completely upright and you know it's some kind of implication that walking upright is better than than not walking upright etc cetera, etc cetera. oh he doesn't have a tail anymore let me eliminate that this guy does have a tail let me do it in a appropriate width this guy has a tail, so you're going to have to excuse my drawing skills. But we've all seen this if you've ever gone to a natural history museum, and you know they'll they'll just make more and more upright um, um, apes, and eventually you get to a human being. And it's this idea that the apes somehow changed into a human being, and 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 I've seen this in 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 multiple contexts, even inside of biology classes and even the scientific community. They'll say, oh, the ape evolved into the human, or the ape evolved into you know the 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 pre-human, the guy that almost stood upright, you know, the guy that was a little bit hunched back, but you know, so he looked a little bit like an ape and a little bit like a human, and so on and so forth. And I want to be very clear here, even though this process did happen, that you did have creatures that over time accumulated changes that uh, maybe their ancestors might have looked more like this, and eventually they looked more like this. There was no, there was no active. Uh, process going all on called evolution. It's not like the ape said, "Gee, I would I would like my kids to look more like this dude." So somehow I'm going to get my DNA to to to, uh, to to get enough changes to look more like this. And it's not like the DNA knew. The DNA didn't say, "Hey, it is better to be walking than to be, you know, kind of hunched back like an ape." And so therefore, I am going to try to somehow spontaneously change into this dude. That's not what evolution is. It's not like, you know, some people imagine that, you know, maybe there was there was a tree there's a tree, and, and on that tree, there's a bunch of good fruit at the top of the tree. There's a bunch of good fruit at the top of the tree. Maybe they're apples. And then maybe you know you have some type of cow-like creature. Or maybe it's some type of horse-like creature that says, gee, I would like to get to those apples. And that, you know, just because they want to get there, maybe the next generation, they keep trying to, to raise their neck. And then, you know, after generation after generation, their necks get longer and longer. And eventually, they turn into giraffes. That is not what evolution is. And that's not what it implies. Although sometimes that the, the everyday notion of the word seems to make us think that way. What evolution is, and actually this is the word that I prefer to use, it's natural selection. Natural selection. Let me write that word down. Natural selection. And literally what it means is is that in any in any population of living organisms, you're going to have some variation. And this is a important keyword here. Variation just means look, there's just some there's just some change. Are you if you if you Look, look at you know the, the the kids in your school. You'll see variation. Some people are tall. Some people are short. Some people have blonde hair. Some people have black hair, so on and so forth. There's always variation, and what natural selection is is this process that sometimes environmental factors will select for certain variations. Some variations might not matter at all, but some variations matter a lot. One example that's given in every biology book, but it really is interesting, is I, I believe they're called the peppered moth, and this was you know pre-industrial, pre-industrial revolution England. That these moths, that you know, some of the moths were. Let me see if I can draw a moth. Well, I think you get the idea. You know, they that little. Let me draw a couple of them. Let me draw a few peppered moths. 
a couple of peppered moths there. Let me draw one more. So most peppered moths, there was just this variation. Some of them were, I guess we could call them more peppered than others. So some of them might look like this. You know, they had, let me do other colors. Let me do a white. So it had spots like that. Some of them might look more like that. And of course, they had some black spots on them. And then some of them might have been, you know, almost, you know, just barely have any spots. And you just have this natural variation. Like you'd see in any population of animals, you'll see some variation in colors. Now, they were all happy probably for thousands of years, just this natural variation. It just it was a it was a non-important trait for these peppered moths. But then all of a sudden the Industrial Revolution happens in England and all this soot gets released from all of these all of these factories that are, you know, running these these steam engines powered by coal. And so all of a sudden a lot of the things that once were gray or white, for example, maybe some tree trunks. Let me draw some tree trunks. Maybe there were some tree trunks that used to look like this. You know, maybe it looked like a maybe it, it kept the Maybe some tree trunks used to look something like this, and a peppered moth would look, would be pretty okay. And you know, maybe there are some tree trunks that were pretty dark. But all of a sudden, the Industrial Revolution happens. Everything gets covered with soot from the coal being burned, and then all of a sudden, all the trees look like this. They're just completely pitch black, or they're a lot darker than they were before. Now, all of a sudden, you've had a major, major change to these moths' environment, and you have to think, what, what is going to select for these moths? Well. One thing that might get these moths are birds and their ability and the ability of the birds to see the moths. So all of a sudden, if the environment became a lot blacker than it was before, you can guess what's going to happen. The birds are going to see the birds are going to see this dude a lot easier than they're going to see this dude because this dude on a black background, he's going to be a lot harder to see and it's not like the birds won't catch this guy. They'll catch all of them, but they're going to catch this guy a lot more frequently. So you can imagine what happens if if the birds start catching these guys before they can reproduce or maybe while they're reproducing what's going to happen this guy the darker dudes are going to reproduce a lot more often and all of a sudden you're going to have a lot more moths that look like this you're going to have a lot more of of these dudes so what happened here was there any design or was there any active change by any of the moths did any of the the moths i mean it looks like a really smart thing to do to become black right your your surrounding became black and you wait a couple of generations of these moths and now all of a sudden the moths are black and you might say wow those moths are geniuses they all somehow decided to evolve into black moths in order to hide from the birds more easily but that's not what happened you had a bunch of you had a lot of variation in your peppered moth population and what happened was is that when everything turned darker and darker these dudes right here and dudettes had a lot more had a lot less success in reproducing these guys just reproduced more and more and more and these guys got eaten up before they were able to reproduce or maybe while they were reproducing so that they couldn't they couldn't produce as many offspring and then this trait just became dominant and then the peppered moth just became you can kind of view it as a as a black moth now you might say okay sal you know that's that's one example i need more this is you know natural selection it's it's purported to apply to everything it explains why or it's it's a it it, it purports to explain why we we why we evolved from you know basic uh, bacteria or maybe even self replicating rna which i will talk about more in the future you know i need more evidence of this i need to see it in real time and the best example of this is really the flu is really the flu and i'll do other videos in the future on what viruses are and how they replicate and viruses are actually fascinating because it's not even clear that they're alive they're literally just little buckets of of DNA and sometimes RNA, which we'll learn is genetic information. And they're just contained in these viral, these little protein containers that are these neat geometrical shapes. And that's all they are. They really don't have, you know, they're not like regular living organisms that, that you know, actively, that actively move and that actively have metabolisms and all that. What they do is they take that little DNA and they inject it into other things that can process it and then they use that DNA to produce more viruses. But anyway, I, I could, we could do a whole series of videos on, the, on viruses, but the flu is a virus. And what happens every year is you have a, a certain type of virus a certain type of virus 
And they have some variation. And I'll just make the variation by, I don't know, how many dots they have. How many dots they have. And they infect, let's say it's a human flu, they infect humans. And slowly our, our immune systems, which we can make a whole set of videos on as well, start to recognize the virus and are able to uh, attack them before they can do a lot of damage. So now you can imagine what happens if, let's say, that this is the current flu. Let me do all of them. They all, they all have these little two dots, and that's how, and we'll talk in the future what these dots are and how they can be recognized. But let's say that's how our immune system recognizes them. They start realizing, oh, anytime I get this little green dude with two dots on it, that's not a good thing to have around, so I'm going to attack it in some way and destroy it before he infects my, my, immune, my, my DNA and all the rest. And so you have a very strong natural selection once once immune systems uh, learn what this virus is, and we'll talk more about what learning means for, for an immune system, that they'll start attacking these guys, right? They'll start attacking these guys. But flu, you, you can kind of think of them as being tricky, but they're not really tricky. They're not sentient objects. But what they do do is they constantly change. So what you have is, in any flu population, you're always having a, a little bit of change. So maybe the great majority of them have those two dots. But maybe every now and then, one of them has one dot. One of them has three dots. And maybe that's just a, it's a random mutation. This just randomly happened. Maybe one in every, maybe this is one in every, I'll make up a number, one in every million of these viruses have this only one dot instead of two dots. But what's going to happen as soon as let's say the human immune system gets used to attacking the virus with the two red dots. Well, then this guy isn't going to have to compete with the other virus capsules for infecting people. He's going to have people's DNA all to himself. And so he or she or whatever you want to call this virus is then going to be more successful. So by next year's flu season, when people start sneezing and are able to spread it on doorknobs and whatever else again, this guy is going to be the new flu virus. So when you see this, this process of every year there's a new flu virus, that is, that is evolution and natural selection in real time. It is happening. It isn't this thing that only happens out over eons and eons of time, although most of, kind of the, the substantial things that we see in our lives, or even ourselves, are based on these things that happened over eons and eons of time. But it happens on a yearly basis. Another example is if you think about antibiotics and bacteria. Bacteria are these little cells that move around. and We'll talk more about them. You know, they, they actually are definitely living. They have metabolisms and whatever else. And, so when, and this is a, just a nice note. When people talk about infections, it could either be a viral infection, which are these things that go and infect your DNA and then use your cell mechanisms to reproduce, or it could be a bacterial infection, which are literally little cells that move around and they release toxins that make you sick and whatever else. So bacteria, these are what antibiotics kill. Anti antibiotics. Actually, I don't think there's a hyphen. Antibiotics. They attack bacteria. They kill them. Now, you've probably, if you know a couple of doctors or whatever, and you say, hey, I'm sick. I, I think I have a bacterial infection. Give me some antibiotics. A responsible doctor says, no, you know, I shouldn't, I won't give you antibiotics just willy nilly because what happens is, is the more antibiotics you use, you're more likely to create versions, and, and I want to be very careful about the word create, because you're not actively creating them. But let's say, you're, and let me finish my sentence, you're, you're, you're very likely to help select for antibiotic resistant bacteria. Now how does that work? So let's say a green, let's say that this is, let's say that these are all bacteria, and you have gazillions of them, right? And every now and then you get one that's slightly different, right? You get one that's slightly different. Now, in a random popula in a population of bacteria, these are all will make you ran equally sick, and this is just some random difference in the bacteria. Maybe on its DNA, some slight different changes happened. But whatever happened, these all are you know the kind of bacteria you don't want to get a lot of them in your system. Your immune system can attack them and fight them off. But if you get a lot of them, and they might kill you or make you sick or whatever else. Now, if everyone just starts using antibiotics when they're not sick. Is, or when they don't really need to in a life or death situation, is you might have an antibiotic that is really good at killing the green bacteria. But what happens if you all of a sudden clean a lot of the, kill a lot of the green bacteria? Well, now the blue bacteria have the whole ecosystem that it was at, before it was competing with all these green dudes to like you know uh, get get at your at your uh, get all the good stuff inside of your body. But now he's all alone. 
And now he can replicate willy-nilly. So now he's going to replicate willy-nilly. And obviously, and this is, once again, he didn't, it wasn't like there was any design, that there was any intelligent process here that said, look, this bacteria should, you know, I'm, this, uh, some bacteria said, oh, I'm going to be a little bit smarter and design myself to resist, the, to, to resist this, you know, this antibiotic threat. No. There's just these random changes that happen, and mutations and, and viruses and bacteria happen frequently. And there are these random changes that happen. And this might be a one in a, you know, in one billion change. Right, but all of a sudden, if you start killing off all of the people that it's competing with, this guy can start replicating really fast and then become the dominant bacteria. And then all of a sudden, then all of a sudden, that antibiotic that you you know that you had developed very carefully to destroy the green dudes is useless, and you have this superbug. You, you, you might have heard the word superbug. That's what a superbug is. It's not like it designed itself somehow. It's just that we got very good at killing its competition, and so we allowed it to take over. And we can't kill it because all of the drugs were just good at killing its competition. That these these bacteria just keep mutating and keep mutating. And if we use these antibiotics a little bit too heavily, we'll always be selecting for the things that won't be affected by the antibiotics. Well, anyway, I think I've spoken long enough, but this is a fascinating, fascinating topic. And I really wanted to make this my very first, my very first, I guess, video or lecture, if you will, on biology. Because if you really went to, you know, biology is the study of life, and we can talk about what life is, whether viruses are living, what not. But if you really want to study living systems, you really can't make any assumptions other than natural selection. We could go to another planet where the creatures don't have DNA, or maybe they have some other type of hereditary uh, uh, information stored in their cells, or they, or they replicate some other way, or they're not even carbon-based. Maybe they're silicon-based. And if we went to that type of a planet in order to study the biology on that planet, everything else we know about biology, about viruses and DNA, would be useless. But if we do understand this one concept, this one concept of natural selection, that your environment will select and it's not, you know, there's no active process here. It's just random stuff happen and they randomly select for random changes and over large swaths of time, and these are unimaginably large swaths of time, those those changes essentially accumulate and they might accumulate into fairly, fairly significant things. We'll talk more about this in another video.